YouTube. Such magnificent, thought-provoking content for all to appreciate and enjoy. Yeah, I fit that weird side of the internet again. <laughs> oh, what's this? Belated media, huh? Well, it's about bloody time. Let's give him a watch. What if episode one was good? Like, really good. What if I were a story exec at Fox and George Lucas came to me and was like, this is the film I'm directing. And I was like, no, let, let's go through this right now and let's see all the points that work and don't work. And I'm going to rework it right now with you. Hmm. Interesting. Wow, that was very well thought out. Great analysis, lots of interesting ideas. Though I personally thought episode one was good. You're kidding me, right? Well, I suppose that might be a bit of a what the f Uh, hi. How are you doing this? <laughs> well, believe it or not, that's only the second question that deserves answering here. You really thought that The Phantom Menace was good? Well, okay, calling it good might be a bit of a stretch, but it had some awesome things about it. Yes, but literally anything good about the film has some drawback associated with it. Oh yeah? Boons at Padres. Too long. Obi-Wan. Underdeveloped. Darth Maul fight scene. Over choreographed. Cutting edge visual effects. Dated as fuck. Jar Jar. I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt and pretend you didn't say that. John Williams Skull. Okay, I'll give you that one. Yes! Okay, I will concede that episode one wasn't a total disaster, but we both know which episode of Star Wars was. Star Wars episode, episode two. two. Yeah, what a mess. Attack of the groans. Yeah, because at the time, everyone hoped that episode one was just a fluke. Everyone thought, yeah, Lucas will have learned from his mistakes. Episode two is going to be awesome. And whilst there legitimately are things episode two does better than one, Overall, I'd have to call it yet another step back. So why, when asked about my opinion of this film, would I describe it as a great big steaming pile of hairy wookie shit? Well, why tell when I can show? This is Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. So, uh, should I go? Oh yeah, cause I, uh, will you stop that? My heart can't take you showing up all the time in unexpected places. What, you mean like this? <laughs> Bye. Damn you and your impeccable green screen. So our second chapter begins back on Coruscant as Padme, now a distinguished senator, arrives for an important vote in the Senate, but our opening scene I find rather unfitting, mostly due to this. I guess I was wrong. There was no danger at all. A few moments later. Oh! Yeah, what is up with that ironic twist of fit there anyway? He says there is no danger at all, and just two seconds later... Ooh! You guys know what I'm on about. It's the comedic tempting fate trope, where he says something that dares the universe to do something, and then it actually happens. How we doing? Things couldn't get much worse. The universe just loves proving me wrong, doesn't it? But why is it here? Again, it's a comedic trope, but it's used just before people have been viciously murdered. Imagine if in episode 4, during the Obi-Wan Vader duel, Han just shouted out, Don't worry, kid, the old man's gonna be fine. No! Oh, sorry. You see, it would totally detract from the moment. George, there's a time and place for jokes in your movie. This isn't one of them. What, is this your second line of dialogue in the film and you've fucked up already? Oh boy. So it turns out Padme used a decoy to fool her would-be assassins. Yeah, this supposedly pacifistic character is perfectly okay putting the lives of her friends in harm's way to save her own neck. What a fucking bitch, am I right? <laughs> but Padme wants answers, so she goes to the Jedi for help. I think the Count Dooku is behind it. He is a political idealist, not a murderer. Uh, just one second. There, I dealt with the literal dickhead. Continue. So Palpatine suggests a Jedi bodyguard for Padme. 
And because poor old Obi-Wan seems to be the only Jedi alive these days that actually seems to do anything, the burden is on him and his apprentice, the now grown up Anakin. But maybe this wasn't the wisest of ideas, as Anakin's balls are currently about as blue as his lightsaber. Annie? My goodness, you've grown. So have you. Grown more beautiful, I mean. Oh, straight in with the compliment, not a wise decision. I mean, look at her face now. I just love this look she's given. She's like, oh god, this is what I'm gonna have to put up with this whole movie, aren't I? You and me both, love. The situation is more dangerous than the senator will admit. I don't need more security, I need answers. I wanna know who's trying to kill me. Oh, come on, Padme, isn't it obvious he wants you dead? You made a certain someone very angry in the last movie. Rick! If somebody ordered a shitty beef and a complain because they say they ordered a shitty shrimp, it's not my fault. He gets a shitty chicken poured all over his fing head. You're quite right. He's very odd indeed. So after our heroes get acquainted and I have my usual homicidal thoughts over murdering Jar Jar, the fans send their regards. <laughs> Padme decides to turn in as Obi Wan and Anakin act as her bodyguards. She programmed R2 to warn us if there is an intruder. Many other ways to kill a senator. I know, but we also want to catch this assassin, don't we, Master? Okay, piss off, movie. I know you want to make Natalie Palmer look amazing, but nobody sleeps like that. With the way her arms are propped up, it looks more like she's posing for the cover of GQ or something. I'm fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. Well, this does at least give us a good opportunity to get to know our two protagonists better. Now, if only what they were saying made sense, we'd be in business. You look tired. I don't sleep well anymore. Because of your mother. I don't know why I keep dreaming about her. Wait a minute. I, are you mean to tell me that in the ten years since Anakin left Tatooine, he never went back to visit his mother? It's like the last thing you said to her, you... Tatooinian twonk. I will come back and free you, Mom. I promise. I mean, I know the Jedi have a bit emotional attachments, but we all know that's utter bollocks. There's inevitably going to be an emotional attachment between Master and Apprentice, for example. And he was a good friend. And there's many instances of Jedi having non-Jedi friends as well, so we know emotional attachments aren't just limited to those within the Jedi Order. So, fly to Tatooine, you twit. See your mom, there's nothing stopping you. I'd much rather dream about Padme. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. He's thinking alright, just, uh, not, not with his brain. I mean, God only knows what he was doing under those robes earlier today. I mean, just look at him. Dirty bastard! <laughs> so the two Jedi continue to bicker about some old bullshit when a drone carrying two poisonous worm like things comes along. Unfortunately, R2 is not feeling up to the task right now. <laughs> Alright, who would stall Windows Vista and R2? But Anakin and Obi Wan sense Padme is in danger regardless as they rush in to save her. <laughs> We will not exceed our mandate, my young Padawan learner. Yes, Anakin, we will not exceed our mandate. Allow me to demonstrate this by jumping out of a fucking hundred story window. Obi Wan Kenobi, esteemed Jedi Master and professional twat! What? So Anakin gives chase on a speeder, and after managing to save his dumbass master, the two give chase to Zamwa Sel, a character who somehow is far more interesting when she's a blob of pixels. But get this, the two seemingly lose her trail as Anakin decides to... Okay, what the hell is he doing? Maybe he committed suicide. Okay, what? Uh, no. No. Yeah. Annie. Bushy. Nine. Nine, 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 nine. What in the name of your sweaty green butt crack was that? Mm. I mean, what did Obi-Wan say earlier? Besides, your senses aren't that attuned, my young apprentice. 
Oh yeah, they're not that great. They're only in tuned enough for you to be able to fall several hundred feet through the air and catch a ride on one ship upon thousands that's traveling hundreds of miles an hour perfectly. Did Michael Jordan just go number two? Because that was some bullshit. Obviously. Okay, so Anakin causes Zam to crash, uh, which is weird, as Anakin wanted to question her to find out who she's working for, so wouldn't you think he'd try to keep her as alive as best he could? Ah, oh, fuck it. Anakin! She went into the club, Master. Patience. Use the Force. Think. Use the Force. Think. Isn't that a bit contradictory? Use the Force. Think. Don't think. Feel. Yeah, Bruce gets it. You wanna buy some death sticks? Uh-oh. Huh. Well, anyway. Do you want some Rocky Brocky? Piss off, man! Okay, bye. Okay, so Anakin goes around the club trying to spot Zam out. And, well, honestly, this could be a really interesting scene. And I think she's a changeling. In that case, be extra careful. Yeah, I mean, Zam could take the form of literally anyone. Anybody in this bar could be her, so Anakin and Obi-Wan are gonna have to use their keen Jedi senses to pick her out from the crowd. Oh, oh Zam could just not bother and look like she did before. <laughs> Ugh, what a missed opportunity. I mean, this could have been a really cool scene. Like maybe Anakin is looking around and all of a sudden he attacks Obi-Wan. And for a moment you think, what the fuck? Then it turns out Zan disguised herself as Obi-Wan as she reveals her true form. And that would show and help demonstrate how powerful a Jedi Anakin is becoming. It would also make this line, Why do I get the feeling you're going to be the death of me? A little more clever, where it would turn out that Obi-Wan wasn't sensing what transpired in episode four, but what instead would happen in a few minutes. Regardless, George, you introduce a shape-shifting character into your movie, but you never have a shape-shift. I mean, she's a freaking assassin. Shape-shifting should have been her greatest asset. She could just mold the rose burn over here and stab Padme in the back when she least expected it. Jeesh. Oh, and speaking of characters not using their tried and tested abilities. And who hired you? It's just a job. Who hired you? Tell us. Tell us now! Uh, I think you're forgetting something, Anakin. Yeah, tell us now! Uh, that, that, that's the extent of my interrogating abilities. Man, if only a Jedi could trick people's minds. A sort of Jedi mind trick, if you will. He still has much to learn, Master. But it doesn't matter anyway, as Django kills Zan before she can spill the beans. So Anakin and Obi-Wan are ordered to split up. Obi-Wan will track down the location of Django, and Anakin will protect Padme. Which is weird, I mean, what happened to the whole always two there are no more, no less thing, but whatever. These guys are clearly too busy to help. In time, you will learn to trust your feelings. Then you will be invincible. I have said it many times. You are the most gifted Jedi I have ever met. Gifted? Is it uh, true what they say about the way you people are gifted? Oh, damn you Mel Brooks for giving me such a dirty mind. Now I have to edit this. I wanted to tell you, you have the biggest dick I've ever seen on a man. Thank you, Your Excellency. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why he ends up putting him in a gib suit. What? Okay, so Padme has the order to return to Naboo, but first, she has to appoint a replacement senator. No doubt someone intelligent, passionate, and all around fit to do the job. Representative Binks? I haven't worked for a year to defeat the Military Creation Act, to not be here when its fate is decided. Sometimes we must let go of our pride and do what is requested of us. Why do you reckon that's what George Lucas told his film crew before every shoot? Anakin, you've grown up. Master Obi-Wan manages not to see it. Um, quick little thing to point out to you, Anakin. Um, you know how just last night that was that flying drone outside of Padme's room with the intent of killing her? Well, uh, isn't this 
flame drawn right outside of Padme's room, drawing the least bit of suspicion then? You know, the one with the laser that doesn't look the least bit like a laser sight on a gun? Isn't that drawing any suspicion, not getting any Jedi senses tingling? Don't get me wrong. Obi-Wan is a great mentor. As wise as... <laughs> I'm deeply sorry, Master. Please don't look at me like that. Why not? It makes me feel uncomfortable. Sorry, milady. Oh, 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 jeez. Somebody get him onto the sex offender database. Stop. Man, I know he didn't actually do anything, but just being in the presence of this guy is enough to give people nightmares. I mean, check out his last victim. I can still hear that voice. Silently. Ah! Ugh. So anyway, Anakin and Padme set off to Naboo as Obi-Wan gets underway in tracking down Django. His only lead is the poison dart he left behind. So in order to identify it, he asks the cook at the local diner. Okay. Hey, oh, buddy. Oh, jeez, it's like what the great mighty poo will look like if you spat in a mustache. <laughs> so, my friend, what can I do for you? You can tell me what this is. Wow. What do you know? <laughs> okay, it's like if he's channeled Owen Wilson then. Wow. I ain't seen one of these since I was prospecting on Subterrell. Beyond the Outer Rim, what you got here is a Camino Saber Dart. Yeah, cause us prospectors know all about... Poison darts? Okay, so Obi-Wan miraculously has the lead as to where the dart came from. Problem is, Camino ain't on the map. Are you sure you have the right coordinates? According to my information, it should appear in this quadrant here, just south of the Rishi Maze. Just south of the Rishi Maze? I don't think the concept of South, East, West and North exists in space, you bellend. What? Okay, so Obi-Wan's an idiot, so he visits a place filled with those far smarter than he is. Hello, Master Obi-Wan. Hello. Yeah, it's glad to see the Jedi Council are doing a bang-up job enforcing safety with the handling of a lightsaber. I mean, this right here, I mean, that's a perfectly safe way to handle something that can slash your hand off. Hello. I'm sorry to disturb you, Master. What help can I be, Obi-Wan? I'm looking for a planet described to me by an old friend. I trust him, but the systems don't show in the archive maps. Hmm. Lost a planet Master Obi-Wan has. How embarrassing. How embarrassing. Hmm. How embarrassing. For some reason, that sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, it was a critic's quote on the DVD. <laughs> So Obi-Wan shows Yoda where the planet should be, as a youngling suggests that the records have been erased. The Padawan is right. Go to the center of gravity's pull and find your planet. You will. Uh, no, find the planet the star orbits he will. I mean, Obi-Wan is going to have to do a lot more research to find out how far away Kamina orbits said star. And that's not to mention how far along the planet cycle is. And, and that's not to mention... There it is, R4. Our missing planet, Camino. Never mind. So Obi-Wan heads down to the planet's surface and meets up with the Kaminoans, who sort of look like if a sperm grew arms and legs. Anywho, it turns out a now-deceased Jedi by the name of Sifo Dias put forward an order for a clone army. Yeah, Sifo Dias. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> but don't let Obi-Wan catch on. He's a little slow. What? But Obi-Wan is here to find Jango, after all, as he organises a meeting with the man himself. Now, Obi-Wan doesn't know yet this is the man he's looking for, but judging by Jango's actions, well, that won't last long. Your clones are very impressive. You must be very proud. I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. Ever made your way as far into the interior as Coruscant? Once or twice. You know, Django, you are doing a piss poor job of concealing your identity. I mean, you walk to your left here, and, well, you've just given over one a direct view of your armor, you Mandalorian moron. Django, I can, like, totally see your armor back there. Possibly. No, no, there's no possibly about it. I can see the helmet and everything. How dumb do you think I am? Fairly. 
All right, that's it, you're dead. Ah! Come back here, you metallic cocksocket! Okay, so Obi-Wan is ordered to bring Django in as we cut back to Anakin and Padme as they've arrived on the boo. Now, lo and behold, people, George Lucas's attempt at writing romance. We used to lie out on the sand and let the sun dry us and try to guess the names of the birds singing. Yes, but can you guess the names of these birds? This one's fuck and that one's off. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. Did I just watch a scene in a canonical Star Wars movie where a young Darth Vader talks about how much he doesn't like sand? Yes. Okay. Makes me feel a lot better. So yeah, God only knows why Padme starts liking this guy. And, oh yeah, of course, yeah, she's contractually obligated to. Otherwise, she'll cause a time paradox, the results of which would cause a chain reaction that would unravel the very fabric of the space-time continuum and destroy the entire universe. Whoa, this is heavy. So the film has no choice but to continue developing the so-called romance between the two. Oh well, I continue my relationship with Senor Cerveza. <sighs> um, a minimum of seven of these is required for viewing episode two. The recommended amount is as many as it takes for you to pass out, but I got a review of it. If Master Obi Wan caught me doing this, he'd be very grumpy. He'd be grumpy of you using the Force on a pair. Ugh, God, the script of this movie is like, Jar Jar. Stupid, incoherent, and it would entertain me greatly to see it be put through a paper shredder. I wish that were so. Well, cyanide pills at the ready, folks. From the moment I met you, all those years ago, not a day has gone by when I haven't thought of you. And some days I thought about you several times. And now that I'm with you again, I'm in agony. Well, at least that's the first time I've ever been able to relate to Anakin in this movie. The closer I get to you, the worse it gets. Oh yeah, sorry about that, Annie. I just let one off. I can't breathe. I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. Can you feel the courage tonight? <laughs> God, how much longer is this scene? Yeah, well that's a minute too long. If you're suffering as much as I am, please tell me. Well, on the bright side, watching this movie can be seen as an alternative to Epicac. Okay, here we go. The closer I get to you, the worse it gets. Yeah! Ooh, one down. The thought of not being with you. I can't breathe. Ah! I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. Ah! No, no, please, no more. My heart is beating, ah! hoping that that kiss will not become a scar. Dad, I'm scared. You are in my very soul. Ah! Get the phone. Tormenting. Call 911. Ah! Lois. Anything Lois is possible, Dad. Ah! Uh, okay, okay. I think it's all gone. I wish that I could just wish away my feelings. <laughs> I, I don't want it. I, I don't, don't like Sam. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to watch episode three? We live in a real world. Come back to it. Okay, so all jokes aside, Padme is in an awkward situation here. Clearly she's not interested in pursuing a relationship and creepy old Anakin is hardly making things any better. And I would sympathise with her character here, were it not for the fact that she's dressed like a bloody dominatrix. 
And that's just part of the ensemble. She wears sexy makeup, she takes Anakin on luxurious canoe trips and romantic picnics, she sits with him by a fireplace in a room that looks like the set of a high class porno. I mean, the candles, the music, the sexy dress, I mean, what's going on here? I honestly feel kind of sorry for Anakin here. He's clearly about as horny as Austin Bloody Powers, and yet this tease is none the wiser. Padme, you look so hot right now, you could give this man an erection. Most impressive. Okay, I am goddamn tired of all this romantic bullshit. When the hell can I see some bloody action? Oh, here's some bloody action. <laughs> Oh yeah, he's fine. He only took a miss out to the face. Walk it off. <laughs> Whoa, Obi-Wan going all harang on our asses there. KO! You win. Huh, <laughs> that'd be cool though. A Tekken-like fighting game for Star Wars and... I forget I said anything. Oh, not good. <laughs> Ooh, do yourself a favor and never freeze for any scenes. The CGI recreations of our facial features will give you nightmares. Oh my god, what's wrong with your face? <laughs> oh yeah, because you'll never know when you'll need a metal sharp thing in your arm. Don't recall him ever having that in this. <laughs> onto that thin ass rope when he fell from that high. Yeah, my arms can't hold on much longer! <gasps> yes, the movie with the talking plastic dinosaurs more realistic physics than this. <laughs> so Jango manages to escape, but thanks to a well-placed homing beacon, everyone manages to follow him to Geonosis, where we admittedly get a pretty sweet dogfight between the two. I mean, I have to give mad props to Skywalker sound. Check out their sweet work with these seismic charges. But back on Naboo, Anakin's in a rough patch as he has a nightmare of his mother. Oh, so he thinks. I reckon he was actually more disturbed by the sand she was standing on. But I digress. He and Padme head for Tatooine to Ashmi's new family, where she is. She was about halfway home when they took her. Those Tuscans walk like men, but they're vicious, mindless monsters. Okay, what kind of direction was Christensen given here anyway? I mean, what kind of face is this? Okay, Hayden, we need more emotion here, more feeling of dread in the face, and I've got it. Pretend you have an itchy butt crack, but you're not allowed to scratch it, okay? And action. 30 of us went out after her, four of us came back. I'd be out there with them, but after I lost my leg, there's little hope she's lasted this long. It's okay, Anakin, I know a guy. In fact, he sat right next to you. Butt scratcher! Butt scratcher! Butt scratcher! <laughs> But scratch, yeah. So yeah, Anakin heads off to save his mom as back with Obi-Wan, he's managed to sneak into the factories on Geonosis as he eavesdrops on a separatist meeting. Here we finally get to meet Christopher Lee's character, Count Dooku. As I explained to you earlier, I am quite convinced that 10,000 more systems will rally to our cause with your support, gentlemen. Fun fact time. The name Dooku derives from the Japanese word Doku, which means poison. Unfortunately though, the origins of the name is far cooler than the foreign language translations, as Dooku sounds suspicious of like Dooku, which in Portuguese means, um, from the ass. Dooku. <laughs> the Techno Union Army is at your disposal, Count. Okay, what the hell was that? I mean, I researched this. This suit here is meant to keep this guy alive, but 
what was up with that tuning sound effect? It looked more like he pressed the wrong button and accidentally played his guilty pleasure iTunes playlist. The Techno Union Army. Why does it hurt when I When I think about you, I touch myself. I'm in love with the coco. Is that your disposal count? So back in Tatooine, we see Anakin has made it to the Tuscan camp where his mom's been held as he makes his way through the camp to find her. Uh, oh, you look so handsome. <laughs> yeah, I bet she's pretty ecstatic over the fact that her son grew up looking like this as opposed to this. Now I am complete. Oh my god, you are not going with that approach. That's the kind of thing parodies of this scene does. Oh, Sylvia. I la, la, la. Oh gosh, I hate breaking their hearts like that. So Shmi dies, not exactly sure why, as Anakin goes ape shit on the sand people. I mean, I know he doesn't like sand, but I mean, jeez. Anywho, he arrives later at the last homestead as Padme just like a hippie for some reason, attempts to get through to him. Why couldn't I save her? I know I could have. Sometimes there are things no one can fix. Like your acting, for example. You're not all powerful. Well, I should be. I will be the most powerful Jedi ever. I promise you. I will even learn to stop people from dying. Well, you could always consider a career as a doctor or something. It's all Obi-Wan's fault. So yeah, Anakin has his tantrum and is quick to drop the bomb that he just committed mass genocide. I slaughtered them like animals. And upon hearing this truly horrifying news, Padme responds... appropriately? To be angry is to be human. Oh yeah, she responds appropriately, alright. For a Nazi! I mean, sweet fried bantha balls on a stick, lady. The guy just confessed to mass fucking murder of women and children. The response to that isn't, eh, to be angry is to be human. No, the response to that is, holy fucking shit, I'm dating a goddamn psychopath. R2, plot a cost for Coruscant. I need to have this guy arrested and jailed for life. Holy shit, woman, you're as Fucked as he is! Or oh, hell, maybe even more so. Remember what Obi-Wan said in A New Hope? Who's the more foolish? The fool or the fool who follows him? Yeah, that's pretty depressingly appropriate, isn't it? No, there, I agree with you. Okay, so after Anakin's done grieving a character we hadn't even seen in the movie up to a few minutes ago, Obi-Wan calls and asks Anakin to retransmit a message to Coruscant. But Kenobi gets captured mid-transmission, so Anakin and Padme quickly set off to rescue him. Meanwhile, back on Coruscant, it turns out Palpatine can't approve the clone army unless the senator proposes he be given emergency powers. And out of literally thousands of senators, guess who's the one to do it? Misa propose that the senate give immediately emergency powers to the supreme chancellor. Okay, ignoring the fact that this somehow got a round of applause, uh, please go back to earlier so I can address the more major fuck up here. I haven't worked for a year to defeat the Military Creation Act, to not be here when its fate is decided. Padme is opposed to the creation of a military, and yet the senator she chose to represent her just set forth in motion the creation of a military. Oops. Okay, so major fuck up on Padme's part, but she does have a bigger concern at the moment as her and Anakin are making their way through the Geonosian factories. Padme finds herself, um, in the middle of a video game. Oh, ah! nasty. Well, I guess she said if she wants to roll in a new Parappa the Rapper video game. But things are looking up for Anakin at least, as he's all set to become a new star on Vine. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. So yeah, the two royally fuck up as they're quickly caught. And... Ugh, couldn't they have just killed them? 
Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid to die. I've been dying a little bit each day since you came back into my life. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I thought that we had decided not to fall in love. That we would be forced to live a lie. And that it would destroy our lives. I think our lives are about to be destroyed anyway. Yeah, nothing more romantic than the threat of death. I truly, deeply love you. This movie's killed me. So if you're strong enough to survive that, we learn that Anakin, Padme and Obi-Wan have been sentenced to death and each have their own respective monster to deal with. Padme's got a cat, Obi-Wan's got one of the arachnids from Starship Troopers and Anakin's got a bull-like creature called a... Reek. Heh, <laughs> well that'd be quite the fitting name if that thing's neutered. I'm sorry man, I don't know why I keep picking on you. I've got a bad feeling about this. You've got a bad feeling about three freakishly large man-eating monsters are approaching you when you're all chained up with no way out and you have a bad feeling about that. No. Anakin, you're being a pessimist. And a pessimist he is as the three manage to escape. Well, okay, maybe the bad feeling he had concerned something else. Ah! Oh, God damn it, I hate sand. It's coarse, rough, irritating against every- Oh, thank God he stopped. And the look continues as one bad motherfucker shows up to shut this party down. What results is... <sighs> one of the coolest moments in any Star Wars film ever. Seriously, this scene almost makes up for the rest of the movie. When I was a kid seeing this in the cinema, I almost shit my pants in excitement. We had never seen this many Jedi on screen at the same time before, so to finally see it was pure cinematic bliss. About the only thing I don't like about this scene is how Django goes out like a pussy, but apart from that, it's cracking. You know what's awesome as this scene is, I have to ask, what the fuck was Windu thinking? Let's start numbers here. Windu sends this track force of Jedi to save Obi-Wan. Remember, not to save Anakin and Padme, as Windu will believe they're still on Tatooine. And how many Jedi does Windu bring along? 212. And how many Jedi survived the battle? 30! Yes, Windu got 182 Jedi killed, just so he could save one. They must think the sun shines out of your ass, Sonny. So the droids have our heroes cornered as Dooku orders a final attack. Well, we're boned. But lo and behold, the group is saved as Yoda turns up just in time with the clones. How he managed to gather all these clones in such a short time is beyond me, but fuck it. The Jedi escape as we cut back to Jango's son Boba, who sadly has lost a father. Oh, unpleasant end to bringing a kid to work there. I'm beginning to agree with you. But back to our heroes, as they've spotted Dooku on a speeder, but the absence of seatbelts in these gunships proves problematic. Batman! Put the ship down! No, Anakin, don't! There's sand down there! Follow that speeder! I can't take Dooku alone! I need you! If we catch him, we can end this war right now! We have a job to do! I don't care! Put the ship down! You will be okay, how long is it gonna be before these twats are gonna hit him? They're right in fucking front of you! Just look at them having a conversation completely oblivious to the gunfire. These guys don't even need to try to stay alive, do they? Oh yeah, I mean, this is a prequel. I mean, I won't die till episode 4. I mean, what's happened to me so far in this movie? I've jumped out of a thousand story window, taken a missile to the face, and I've seen these two together. I can live anything. 
Hey, Death. Here's you in this movie. I'm not following you. I'm saying you shit at your job. Huh. Man, I haven't seen him this lethargic since Rhodey got shot in Civil War. Okay, so Obi-Wan convinces Anakin to do his duty as the two Jedi make it to the hangar for a fight with Dooku. Anakin begins by, well, being Anakin. You're going slowly on the left. Taking him now! No, Anakin, no! No! Yeah! Yeah, the best part of the movie was that. So Obi-Wan has no choice but to face Dooku alone. And, well, let's just say that Qui-Gon wouldn't be too pleased with this Padawan's performance. I foresee you will become a great Jedi Knight. So Dooku moves in for the kill, but Anakin saves his master by embracing his inner Italian plumber. Yes! Brave of you, boy. But I would have thought you had learned your lesson. I am a slow learner. Anakin! Whoa, 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 whoa. We've just had a major continuity fuck up. Go back a bit. Okay, so see where Obi-Wan is right here, just below Anakin's and Dooku's sabers. Right, now keep watching. And, hello. He's gone. He's been taken up. Oh, he's oh, been taken up. I changed. No, there he is. Oh, there he is. So it's Anakin's turn to kick some ass, and hey, we get to see some awesome akimbo action. I mean, we've never seen this before in a duel. Like that. Oh. Disappointed! Yeah, this whole fight is a massive disappointment. It's easily the worst duel of the series. I mean, look at the Darth Maul fight again. That's how you do a lightsaber fight. Fast, exciting, dramatic, a kick-ass score from John Williams, and topped off with some phenomenal stunt work from the one and only Ray Park. Fucking A! But here, what do we get? Shitty-ass close-ups. Drunk, I'm fighting Dooku too. What the, what the hell? Did, did you see that? Anakin just froze in place for like a full second there. Watch again. What did Dooku have someone behind the scenes helping him out in this fight? Finish him! Fatality. But it's not over for Dooku, for there is a new challenger. And his name is John Cena! No, 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 that, that'd actually be kind of cool. No, instead we get Yoda. Now, usually I'd be excited about Yoda showing up, but instead we get this. Yeah, you ever have one of those moments where all your life you wanted to see something, and then when you actually got to see it, you realised how shit your wish was? Yeah, that showed up with a lightsaber. I mean, we all wanted to see this, but in my opinion, it's just too cartoony to enjoy. I mean, all I see here is an old man waving his stick at the ground. Uh, um, uh, you, you'll make this look good in purse, right? Oh yeah, I like my right bitches. Cracking. Yoda just wasn't meant to fight with a saber. He should have solely been a force user, and this fight here should have been between Dooku and Windu. Because if Yoda can do all these flips and seemingly have the stamina of Mo Farah, why does he carry the cane everywhere he goes? Hell, he uses what is essentially a flying Segway earlier in the film. How lazy is that, considering he can do this? <laughs> Okay, so the duel ends in a stalemate as Dooku's all like, fuck this shit, I'm out, as he distracts Yoda with a pillar about to fall on Anakin and Obi-Wan. Oh, come on, guys, you seriously can't get out of the way? Look, I know you're wounded, but you don't need an arm to get up. Oh, shit, don't worry, guys. <laughs> Guys, get out of the fucking way, this bitch is heavy! Guys, get, 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 you know what, fuck it. Screw you guys, and in him. 
So Dooku escapes, and yeah, see, look at them getting up on their own now, wankers. But yeah, back with Dooku, he arrives on Coruscant as we see he's been in cahoots with Sidious all along. You have done well. I have good news for you, my lord. Your roommate cosplay won first prize at Comic-Con. Excellent. Uh, but, 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 not excellent. That's the other creepy old dude saying. Oh, excellent. Okay, that's clearly not who I meant. Well, duh. Anywho, Palpatine, your catchphrase is a step down from excellent. Good. 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 Hey, Palpatine, how's your ice cream sundae? Good. Well, good. So, yeah, the film is quick to wrap up, so I will too. Yoda says the Clone War has begun, which is weird. I mean, does he have the authority to name wars? I I'm thinking about it too much. Uh, a bunch of actors look over a shitload of blue screen and, uh, oh, hey, an actual set. Now, if only the actors were as believable. And for this private wedding, we're doing the short, short, short version. version. Do you? Yes. Do you? Yes. Good, you're married. Kiss her. So that was Attack of the Clones. Seems prudent it's episode two, because this movie is shit. I mean, okay, I won't go as far as to say that I hate this movie. I mean, it's bad, but it does legitimately have redeeming qualities. I love Hugh McGregor as Obi-Wan. You can't go wrong with Christopher Lee. There's some pretty sweet action sequences with phenomenal sound design. The cinematography is pretty nice with many shots using the rule of thirds quite effectively. And there are a couple of funny moments. You wanna buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. I don't want to sell you death sticks. You want to go home and rethink your life. I want to go home and rethink my life. But this is one film where the bad outweighs the good because so much time is spent on this horrendous romance between Anakin and Padme. Lucas was way out of his depth here. The guy desperately needed someone else to write his dialogue for him, cause romance is way out of his comfort zone. John Williams, God bless him, tries his best to make the romance work with a legitimately memorable and heartfelt theme for the two, but this dialogue, it's so bad. You are in my very soul, torment. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. You're right. Now I have noticed that with the jump from episode 1 to episode 2 is that there is more an attempt at character banter, mostly between Anakin and Obi-Wan. And this is appreciated, but it's shaky. Now sometimes there can be a funny line. I was beginning to wonder if you'd got my message. I retransmitted it just as you had requested, Master. Then we decided to come and rescue you. Good job. But you'll notice that there is little rapport between these two, as they seem to do nothing but argue and moan about each other. Episode 2 should have demonstrated how much these two were good friends. It'd have helped make Anakin's fall to the dark side all the more tragic once Episode 3 came around. And this lack of bond between Anakin and Obi-Wan is pretty much apparent for every character in the movie. I just get the impression that no one cares about each other here. In The Phantom Menace, at least, there were said connections. You got a sense that Anakin and Padme liked each other. Just quick little moments like this. With the communications breakdown, we've been very concerned. I'm anxious to hear your report on the situation. It all helped give the impression that these two one day would become more than friends. But once episode two comes around, you'd swear that not only are they not lovers. My goodness, you've grown. So have you. Grown more beautiful, I mean. Not only are they not friends. Please don't look at me like that. But they honestly seem to hate each other. Excuse me. I'm in charge of security here, milady. So then falling in love feels incredibly unearned. There is literally one moment in the entire film where there's any semblance of chemistry. And it's here. You're making fun of me. Mm, no, no, I'd be much too frightened to tease a senator. <laughs> That's a legitimately nice moment between the two. If only there was more of it. There was also a better main character relationship in episode one. Quite a bit of Obi-Wan felt closer than Obi-Wan and Anakin ever did. They argued a little, yeah, but there's a heartfelt scene between the two where Obi-Wan apologises, Qui-Gon forgives him, and you sense a strong relationship between the two. And it serves as a nice precursor to Qui-Gon's death, and you honestly feel for Obi-Wan. It, it's too late. It's... No. Obi-Wan. Promise. Promise me you will train the boy. Yes, Master. 
Honestly, Qui-Gon dying is a sad, powerful moment in my opinion. A hell of a lot more tragic than anything Episode 2 has to offer, or even 3 for that matter. Now, for me, the reason I don't really like Episode 2 is mostly thanks to the god-awful romance that eats up so much screen time. But the moment Anakin and Padme are wheeled out into the Geonosis arena, then the film actually gets good, cause everything that takes place in this one scene is what I wish the rest of the film was like. Over when Anakin and Padme first face off against these creatures, all without weapons, which makes it more interesting to watch, all the Jedi show up and I'm just in awe at the sight of it, there's some legitimately funny gags with 3PO, Christopher Lee and Samuel L. Jackson get time to shine. Love this scene! It's all shot on crappy blue screen, but it's still a kick-ass time. But then the clone troopers show up, they go fight a faceless war, and then all of a sudden... I'm out of shits to give. So all in all, Episode 2 is bad, but it is sprinkled with a bit of good here and there. It's easily the worst of the theatrically released Star Wars films, but hey, at least it gave us this. And this. Which led to this, uh, yeah, I I'm glad this film exists. But three years later, a film came along that was a definite improvement. A film that if only it had its kinks ironed out, could have been regarded as good as the original trilogy. But unfortunately... I have seen a, a security hologram of him killing younglings. <laughs> <laughs> the kinks remain. I'll see you next time. <laughs>